Good morning. You know, I'm so thankful to the Lord, but also to my church family for the opportunity to uh, be here and to be able to uh, preach again this morning. And, you know, you just don't know exactly what, you know, how the details are going to sort out and what the future looks like. So I just cherish, I really do cherish the opportunity uh, to, to be here and to continue this series. It's been very meaningful to me um, to go through this I Am series because, you know, it was our hope and our prayer that as we go through these passages that we would make much of the Lord and that he would be magnified. And as we look at his nature, you know, it's so easy to kind of write ourselves between the lines. And really what we wanted to do with this particular passage is just to focus on the truths of God's nature as he's revealed it, truths about himself to us. And really that's what we want to do here. And that's just such a comfort to see his nature, his holiness, his sovereignty, his power, but also his abiding love with us. So chronologically, this is the last of the seven I am statements found in John. But um, as we talked about uh, last week, we're doing this a little bit out of order, and we had reasons for that. But chronologically, this is the last of the seven I am statements in the Gospel of John. And so this week, our passage is, is, and we read it a moment ago, it's full of symbolism and imagery and illustrations, which is, I find, really meaningful. If you really take a look at the illustrations that Jesus uses, just a quick side note about this, I think it's really interesting. A lot of preachers and teachers try to use illustrations because they are so meaningful. They help us to really unlock a deeper meaning and connection and to remember these truths that we're hearing. But when you look at Jesus in his ministry, use illustrations, they're just so much more appropriate than anything I could have come up with. And I really started thinking, you know, a lot of times you ever use an analogy and it works to a point, and then if you take it almost too far, it just becomes absurd. It's just not perfect. And I, want, and I was thinking, you know, our analogies are, are limited in their application. But I thought, you know, when Jesus uses an illustration, it's always just completely perfect, and you can't sort of um, wander off into something absurd uh, if you're, you're following the Holy Spirit's guidance in, in, in unlocking the meaning of, let's say, a parable. They're always just spot on and perfect. And I was thinking, you know, not only does Jesus in his omniscience choose the perfect visual, so in this case it's going to be a vine, and the vine dresser, and the fruit that the branches produce, right? Not only in his omniscience does he choose the perfect visual to accompany his teachings, right? A, a visual that's going to really settle in and be meaningful to his, his target audience and have cultural relevance to them. But also, in his omnipotence, he created the visuals. You think about that? He created the visuals themselves with the foreknowledge of his eventual teachings during his time on the earth. In other words, he created the hands and he also created the glove. So it's just, it's so perfect and it's amazing. And I could never recapture that with a, with a sermon illustration the way that our Lord does time and time and time again. And it's just, it's so amazing just to be in awe of that. So context is key to understanding sort of the nuance of this illustration. So let's take a look at John chapter 15. Now, John chapter 15 is part of a larger dialogue with Jesus' disciples. And you saw as we went through the scripture reading that Jesus calls those disciples his friends. And they have a very close relationship. And right now in this moment and also for a few chapters later, they're in a very private and intimate setting. A very, you know, close group of friends. Jesus is sharing some parting words and lessons before eventually he's going to be arrested and put to death. And these are some of his last moments with the disciples that he's spent so much time with, pouring into in the last few years. So he was providing some very practical insights to those disciples regarding Christian, Christian living. And I think one of the reasons for this is the fact that he knows that he's going to be leaving them in a short time, but the disciples are going to remain here on the earth. And they're going to be faced with all kinds of trials and persecutions and struggles. And he wants for those friends, those companions, those disciples to remain steadfast as they seek to make even more disciples after Jesus ascends into heaven. Now, he's going to give them the Holy Spirit to guide them in his absence. They're not alone. He's going to be with them. 
But we need to understand that context. In a lot of ways, these are some of Jesus' last sort of parting words, closing thoughts to his disciples before he's taken up into heaven. So I want to skip ahead just a little bit to John chapter 17, just so you can see sort of how this whole dialogue with his disciples ends. He offers a prayer. It's a sort of priestly prayer or an intercessory prayer where he prays to his father, but on behalf of those friends he loves so dearly. And I want to just read a a portion of this because I think it helps us to understand more about John chapter 15 and, and, you know, the verses we're going to be zeroing in on. So just a few, you know, verses from this section here. John chapter 17. Listen to, to the tone of voice here. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all uh, whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. You see the sort of conclusion, the type of words used here, it sounds like a final closing statement or or remarks to his friends. Skip ahead a little bit. Verse 9. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. You see, he's saying, that he's about to leave them behind. They are in the world, but I am going to you. This is, again, sort of a parting address. Verse 12, while I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. So this sort of tone in this prayer, and also you couple that with the, the illustration in John chapter 15, you can see the deep and personal connection that Jesus has with his disciples, but also the relationship that he has with all of us, disciples that years later have also stood face to face and are confronted with the truth of the gospel and have become his disciples. So this is a word of encouragement, John chapter 15, for the difficult times ahead and really a, uh, uh, capturing the essence of daily Christian living. So let's introduce our characters. Verse 1, John chapter 15, verse 1. We've got a few characters. Number one, right from the very first line, I am the true vine. So the first character, I guess you could call it in this illustration, would be Jesus, the true vine, which implies that there are other vines and other vineyards that are untrue. And boy, do we need to be careful. So rather than providing life and sustenance to us, they suck the life out of us. And they, they suck the purity out of us. Another character would be the vine dresser. And the vine dresser is identified in this passage as being God the Father. I am the true vine and my Father is the vine dresser. Now, the vine dresser patiently tends to the vine, tends to the branches, and tends to the harvest. And there are a few very important judgment calls that are going to be um, made by the vine dresser on how to properly handle the branches and to ensure that they are producing the best and the biggest harvest. Vine dressers are highly skilled and knowledgeable, and really this represents that God is active in our lives every single day. So to become a vine dresser in Bible times, you really needed to know what you were doing because if you kind of went hog wild and started trimming back these branches and you took it a little bit too far, you could actually harm the vine and you could end up killing 
that plant, and that would have obviously devastating consequences. Or if you're too cautious and don't prune it back enough, well, you could have dead branches that are sort of weighing down the rest of the vine and, and wasting valuable um, resources for the, for the greater vine. And that could be a problem as well. So the vine dresser is highly skilled and needs to know what's going on. This relationship between the vine and the vine dresser really is another example of the oneness, but also the distinctness of the Godhead, of the Trinity. The persons of, of the Trinity each have different uh, roles in this particular example, but you can also see that connected um, relationship and oneness. So the first point, I have three of them uh, for this morning here, is the skill of the vine dresser. Two, abide in the vine. And three, glorify God with a bountiful harvest. So first, the skill of the vine dresser. If we take a, a little bit of a, a step back, we could probably see two reasons why somebody would need to prune a, a vine. Why would a vine dresser need to trim or prune or cut back some of these branches? Well, number one, to cut away dead branches that have no life in them in order to encourage new growth to take place. And second would be to trim healthy branches so that they will bounce back even stronger and produce even more fruit. Those are two reasons why someone would trim back a vine. So let's unpack that. First, they'll take away the dead branches that do not bear any fruit. Now, if you look at this, you might think of first, maybe this is talking about um, maybe taking away somebody who wasn't genuine in their faith in, in sort of a wheat and chaff scenario where you're just discarding um, the frauds and you're left with what is real. I'm not sure that's exactly what this is talking about here. And it's definitely not symbolizing a genuine believer that has their salvation snatched by the vine dresser and tossed aside because scripture affirms scripture. So it's not a renunciation of a person's salvation. That would be a contradiction to other passages in scripture. So if not that, what do we mean by dead branches then? So as far as I can tell, and we'll kind of walk through why I think this is the conclusion, it's a reference to an unfruitful believer who sort of backslides his way into uselessness, backslides his way into not producing fruit anymore, and therefore the vine dresser would need to prune this branch. And it would be a very sort of painful and violent but necessary act of love to essentially discipline the vine that is not bearing any fruit. If you would, flip over to Hebrews um, Hebrews chapter 12, it's on page 1009 if you're using one of these Bibles in the chair a rack in front of you. Hebrews chapter 12. Verses 5 through 6. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, or be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. So a father who loves his son is going to discipline the son in order to keep his paths straight. That's the loving thing to do. And a vine dresser who cares for the vine is going to trim it back and prune it for the sake of further growth. It's an act of love. So remember the context, though. Remember, he's talking to his disciples, and I believe that this passage is illustrating different believers with varying levels of bounty, a, a differing level of, of productivity when it comes to bearing fruit. The passage is specifically speaking to the disciples and those on earth who would remain behind when Jesus has ascended into heaven. That's what this passage is all about. There are other passages, other teachings, other parables, other illustrations that speak to our relationship before the Lord and our eternal condition, our eternal security, our assurance of salvation. But there are a few important hints in this passage that lead me to believe that's not what this illustration is referencing. The first one, and maybe you kind of picked them out as we were working through this, the first one is in verse 2. Every branch of mine. Every branch of mine. The lost are not his branches. 
every branch of mine. He's clarifying and specifically talking about his branches, those connected to the true vine in his vineyard. The second evidence would be verse 3. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Already you are clean. And the fourth one is in verse, or excuse me, the third one is in verse 4. Abide in me. The word abide means to remain in something. And that's where I got the title from. Remain undisturbed. That's the definition for abide, is to remain steadfast and unwavering. So you could remain sort of casually smacked around and knocked around by the wind and the waves. But that's not really remaining. That's, that's way too fleeting. Remain undisturbed, meaning remaining steadfast and anchored in the truth. So the word abide means to remain undisturbed. But in order to remain in something, you have to be in that something in the first place. So he's talking to his branches connected to his vine in his vineyard. He's giving a warning to his disciples and to us as well that a true believer in Jesus Christ must be attached to the vine in order to receive the flow of life that comes from the vine, and that flow of life is what produces good fruit. The second reason to prune a branch is actually for those branches that are doing well and producing fruit, but by trimming it back, it's going to bounce back even stronger and healthier, and that crop, that harvest is going to be even more abundant. Now, that pruning could come in many forms, all of which, though, come from God. They all come from the, the vine dresser. And it, it come, there are many different ways. We can touch on a few of them in just, just a second, but James chapter 1, I think, is an excellent example. James chapter 1, starting at verse 2. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Well, how, why, what joy and what benefit would there be to running into trials and struggles and persecutions of, of various kinds? You know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. It's all for growth. So be careful what you wish for. Because a lot of us, I think, self-included, want to see the fruit. You want to see, you want to look back on your life and you want to see growth. But oftentimes, as we're living our daily lives, we become flustered, very frustrated when these sort of trials enter the picture. And we almost shrug them off like, man, if I didn't have this, then I could just run without these hindrances towards the goals. And like, it's keep, you almost see the trials as keeping you from the growth that we really would like to see. But if we, we really pay attention to this illustration, we see that we don't want to shrug off the very tool and vehicle that's necessary for the growth that we so desperately want to see. There's a very interesting line that I, I read um, this week. If branches could speak, they would confess that the pruning process hurts, but they would also rejoice that they will be able to produce more and better fruit, right? Quality and quantity. It's necessary. It's painful. It hurts but it's necessary. And really the key point here is that the vine dresser is willing to do whatever it takes to ensure that the branches are producing the fruit. And if, and if it's a wayward branch that needs to be trimmed and then there will be new growth from the base, from the vine, maybe it's a hard reset. <laughs> maybe it's a rock bottom moment and just it's time to start over. And maybe it's, it's somebody who's, who's really growing and excelling and, and, learning the, the spiritual gifts they've received and putting them in action, but hasn't really been challenged. Maybe it's time to, to hack off a piece of that branch and to swallow the pride and, and, and once again realize that that true growth and that true life is not found in striving. It's, it's found in the vine and, and being clipped <laughs> like a branch to being clipped and pruned is often the step that, that really calls us back to the base at the vine, and that's exactly where we're supposed to be. So how does the vine dresser prune us? Just a quick re recap, a couple different ways. Through the sovereign allowance of suffering. He's not making us suffer to see us suffer because he's a spiteful, 
um, sort of a God who enjoys seeing his children suffer just for the sake of suffering. There's a reason behind it all. And you look at, I think, a front row seat to that is what happened to Job. God allowed every single one of those terrible hardships to happen to Job. God allowed every single one. There was not one persecution, not one struggle, not one trial that slipped under the fence. God allowed every single one. And they all happened for a reason. And it grew Job. It tested him to his core. He almost reached a breaking point. I mean, you see chapters and chapters of him just crying out. That's a man who's really running out of options. And his friends aren't even giving him great counsel to begin with. But it was a test. And the stronger the believer, the bigger the test. Because a little bit, I mean, if you give a senior in high school um, a kindergartner's level test, um, it's not going to necessarily challenge them to the point of the, you know, giving them a test based in the course material that they are learning in their senior year. You have to meet the person where they are in their walk and challenge them there. A person who, t- who takes a, um, a test on an elementary level who's more advanced than that is going to shrug it off. It's not going to challenge them and, and, and kind of break them. Make them go back to the core, go back to the vine. That's exactly what happened to Job. He was a righteous man, so he received a colossal test. But it was an act of love. The sovereign allowance of suffering. It's like pruning a branch that needs to be snipped. How about just discipline? Just discipline, like we read in Hebrews chapter 12. Or sometimes we are pierced, and I love that I mean, illustration, because being snipped like the vine dresser or, or a, the sword of the spirit, sometimes we are pierced with the word of God. It's like a sword of conviction that just cuts straight to the heart, and it, and it hurts. <laughs> it really does. But it's part of that growth process that we so desperately need. The skill of the vine dresser. It's so easy as the branches to cry out to the vine dresser, and why are you doing this? I mean, really, was that really necessary? To, to, to plant, that did I have to lose this loved one? Did I have to lose this job? Did I, I mean, and it's so easy to question, but the vine dresser knows what he's doing. The vine dresser knows. The second point here is abide in the vine. Remain in the vine. If indeed you are clean, right? Going back to verse three, already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Verse four, abide in me and I in you. If indeed you are clean, abide. Did you know abide is used 66 times in John's books? Not just his gospel, but the other books as well. It's a very, very important word, and it's used many, 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 many times. Abide, to remain undisturbed, to stand your ground. So kids, if you're still with us here, let's see if you guys can nail this big idea. I don't have Alex here today, so you guys got to step up. Jesus wants us to what? There it is. Abide in him. What would be another word for abide? What do you think? What does abide mean? Who said that? Remain. Thank you. Yes, Jesus wants us to remain, to stay close to him, to to, to remain, to abide, to stay with him. Listen, guys, it's really important. In this story, as you're reading through this, we're the branches. And it's really important, see, we branches can sometimes have a mind of our own. It's really important to understand that the branches don't have any life if you cut them off from the vine and throw them off to the side to do their own thing. The branches grow and the branches produce fruit if the branches are directly plugged into the vine. That is it. We're nothing on our own. We cannot produce life by ourselves. We can only draw from the vine. The only way, think about it, the fruit of the Spirit. (laughs) There's another fruit illustration. The fruit of the Spirit can only be produced by people who, through Christ, are plugged into the vine, producing the fruit of the Spirit. We can't strive to produce the fruit of the Spirit in our own flesh. Maybe temporarily you could fake it till you make it, but it's not enough. That fruit is produced by the Holy Spirit, and we need to be in communion with Christ in order to achieve that. He's going to produce, and it's not even, I shouldn't even say for us to achieve it, because it's not like we're the ones growing this fruit anyway. 
We just submit to the Father's will, and, and he will take care of that. He will produce the fruit. We just need to submit in obedience. Um, although we exist in the world, we, we cannot be attached to it. We exist in the world, but we need to exist while we're attached to Christ. You know, I think about, like, think of a, of a vine growing up a building. There was actually a, a house um, over on, um, oh, nuts, which one was it? Was it Franklin Hill? Uh, it had that wisteria growing up the side of it. I think it was Franklin Hill. There's this brick house, beautiful property, and there's this vine growing up it with these purple uh, flowers. It was, it was amazing. You could just watch the thing just going up the side of the building. And, you know, I just thought to myself, you have that vine going up the building, but what would happen if you snipped that off? Because you're like, wow, beautiful flower. You just snipped it off and you just threw it in a pile. Well, okay, you might think, oh, well, we're, we're, we're reaching the lost, right? This is ugly, so we're going to snip the flower and just toss it over there. Well, the flower is going to die. So how do you reach the world, be in the world, without attaching yourself to it? I think there's a great, great, great passage that addresses this. You probably know it already by heart, and I think I do, but I don't want to mess it up. So I'm looking it up anyway. It's Matthew chapter 28. I always miss a phrase for some reason when I try to quote the Great Commission, so we're going to play it safe here this morning. Matthew 28, starting at verse 18. And Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore. Okay, wait a second. Go, therefore. Therefore. What is the therefore, therefore? What are we going with or under? What's the banner? All authority has been given to me. Go. <laughs> Can you imagine if we tried to go without the authority? What would happen then? Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And I'll check back in, you know, two to however many thousand years and see how you're doing. No. And I, and behold, I am with you always. There's the remaining. There's the abiding. We're not doing this in our own strength. We're not doing this on our own power. We are, are, are going out into the world to make disciples as we remain connected to the vine. We're not going to detach ourselves from the vine and just belly flop into the world and see how it goes. We have to be connected to the vine. To abide in the vine means to remain in prayer, remain in scripture, remain in fellowship, remain in worship, remain in the light, remain in communion, remain in sacrifice, remain in the truth, and remain in the life. Undisturbed, unwavering, and uncompromising. So let's talk about the results here. The last point, which is glorify God with a bountiful harvest. He says, actually, I got to go back. Glorify God with a bountiful harvest. Verse 7. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Anything? Anything at all? Is that true? Of course it is. Jesus said it. Of course it is. What about a similar statement in John chapter 16, verse 23? Very similar. Just, in, again, in the same discourse, but just a few verses later. Uh, John 16, 23. In that day you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. Very, very, very similar verse, very similar wording. So what does it mean? That's a pretty um, big promise, <laughs> weighty promise. Anything you ask in my name, I will give it to you. Well, it's true because Jesus said it. So what does it mean? 
It's not a ringing endorsement of a blank check, name it, claim it sort of theology, a magic formula request. It's a qualified promise. So what are the terms and conditions? Let's look at the whole thing. If you abide in me, that's a big condition. <laughs> Always. <laughs> if you abide in me and my words abide in you. That's a massive condition. Massive condition. What does it mean? Well, it begs the question. If you were to pray and ask something of the Lord, if the criteria was met, if you abide in Christ and his words abide in you, if the criteria was met, it begs the question, how would you pray and what would you ask for? If those two criteria are truly met, if you abide in Christ and if Christ's words abide in you, if that criteria was met, how would you pray and what would you pray for? Th put it this way. If the conditions are met according to this promise, what are some of Jesus' specific words that would guide your prayers and shape your requests? I'll give you one. How about his words in 1 John 5.14? And this is the confidence that we have towards him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. That's one of his words that would be ringing loudly in the back of my mind as I pray. Think about Jesus' example in the garden. His prayer harmonized beautifully with the whole of Scripture because he's the, the gold standard of abiding in, in the words of the Father abiding in him. Look at how he prayed. My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So I try to think. What would that prayer have sounded like if I prayed it, but rather than praying it in the shadow of the whole of Scripture, I prayed it sort of in the name of blank check Christianity? See, the problem with, I'll just, I'll just sort of shortcut it and just call it name it, claim it theology. What is the problem with that? Well, the problem is that more power, if you think about it, more power is vested in our faith than in God's response. And here's why. It's, it's a dangerous idea to think that he's standing there, like very excited to give it to you, whatever you asked for, and ready to give it to you. But he just can't do it quite yet because you just didn't demonstrate enough faith. Well, where's all the responsibility? Well, where's all the pressure? Where's all the power? And really, where's all the faith? Well, it's in self. That's not the place that I want to be. And if I was truly in Christ and his words were truly in me, I wouldn't pray like that. Because <laughs> I don't know what's best for me. So I would absolutely launch with what I'd love to see happen. <laughs> but I would understand that I don't even know what's best for me. The vine dresser does. So not my will, but your will be done. That does not minimize the power of this promise. It doesn't, it doesn't minif minimize it at all. It still has its potency. But it forces us not to look to ourselves and our own mind and our own faith and our own requests and the things that we would love to see happen. But it really calls us back to the abiding. That's the key. The abiding in him in his words constantly abiding in me. Remain in Jesus and his word in you. His word being the scriptures must be planted at the very center of our lives. And they must remain there undisturbed. Think about all the ways that the scriptures could become disturbed in our own life. They're there, but we're not really remaining there. They could become disturbed or jostled. Think about it. 
Don't change it. Don't minimize it. Don't conform it to the culture. The word is what it is. And, and we need to remain in it, and it needs to remain in us. In everything else, we can conform to that pattern. But that pattern, the scriptures, God's words to us, cannot bend and cannot break. That is our fruit. That is our worship. That is our calling and purpose. So why did Jesus say all this to his disciples? Well, I think that knowing what they were about to encounter, he didn't want to leave his disciples directionless. Because if you think about it, have you ever felt like your life is sort of directionless? Sort of feels like it's lacking some meaning and purpose? Without a meaning and a purpose and a direction for your life, what are you going to replace that with? All kinds of worrying and doubting and uncertainty and second guessing. He doesn't want to see the branches in his vineyard getting sick and dying and failing to produce the fruit. Up until this point, they've had the luxury of the vine sitting right there in front of them. So be abiding in the vine. They could just reach out and touch him. He's about to go up into heaven. And, and I didn't, you know, as a disciple of Christ, didn't have the, the luxury of being able to walk and talk with him during the earthly ministry. So my only relationship, it is a sufficient one, I'm just trying to make a point. My only relationship with Christ is sort of a, uh, a, a um, more spiritual connection than, than a physical connection like the disciples would have, would have realized during Jesus' ministry. He doesn't want to see the branches in his vineyard getting sick and producing a lesser crop. And it's going to be difficult for them. They were able to see the vine physically right in front of them for so many years. And now they're going to have to have and maintain that same connection, holding on to the vine, but from a distance. That's going to be a big adjustment. He doesn't want to see them getting sick. So what are the results? The passage is organized in a way that Jesus is building up to the conclusion. So we're about to get to the conclusion. Let's talk results. Verse 8. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. That is our purpose. That is our calling. That is our objective. That is our highest responsibility, is to worship and bring glory to the Father. That's it. That's the objective. And the Father is glorified in our bountiful, abundant fruit. And the second thing, verse 9, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. See, the, the joy flows from the vine to the branches, and you can see it in the fruit. And he's talking to his disciples here so that the Father would be glorified, but also that they may have joy. Not joy from their own experiences, their own life. That's temporary. That's fleeting. I wouldn't even call it joy. I'd call it happiness. He wants them to have the joy that comes from the Father, and he wants it to remain in their life. So I'll close with this. We want to make much of the Lord in, in who he says he is, right? What he says about himself. And in this passage, Jesus says that he is the one true vine. And if that's the case, that Jesus is the one true vine, well, that makes us all the branches. And his life flows through our own and gives a, a greater meaning and purpose to those stalks than we could have ever realized on our own. Those stalks, if they were broken and detached from the vine and left to fend for themselves, wouldn't produce a lick of fruit on their own. Everything that we have, we owe to the vine. 
So abide in the vine. Remain undisturbed in the vine. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Remain in the truth. Remain in his life. Remain in his word. And as he says, his word will remain in you. And that is going to be really the life flow of everything that we do. Don't lose connection to the vine. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for your constant love and care and direction that you've given to us and for sustaining us and, if necessary, pruning us back. There are so many times in our lives where we need um, humility, we need discipline, we need a bit of a reality check, we need to be challenged in our faith. And a lot of times I wouldn't choose that for myself. But Lord, you know what's best for us. And I just pray that when we experience those times of struggle and of pruning, of trimming back, that we wouldn't um, take that with a grudge, but that we would embrace and learn to trust in the vine, in the vine dresser. And Lord, I just pray that we would keep our eyes fixed on you in these dark times that we're living in, and we just pray that we would be committed to you and committed to your purpose for us, which is to glorify God and make disciples. I pray that you would give us the strength to reach a fallen world and to share the gospel um, as you've called us to do. I pray that you'd give us the strength and the courage to be able to do that. And Lord, I just, I pray that we would um, be producing good fruit, that people would see that fruit, that it would point them straight to you and that you would be glorified in it. Um, Father, I thank you for this church family and for the constant love and support that they have, they've shown me and uh, in my family. And Lord, I just pray that we would continue to grow this relationship, even if it's uh, from a distance for a time. And I just pray that um, you would just do a mighty work, um, not just here, but in Lynchburg as well. And um, I just pray that your will would be seen in all things. Um, I thank you so much for this time we've been able to spend in worship. And Lord, as we close, I just pray that the words of, of this song would just really resonate with us. And as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper, I just pray that we would be constantly in, in reflection, in remembrance of the great work that you accomplished for us on the cross. May we never forget it. May we never um, cease to be thankful for that. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.